and I will live forever. The only thing that is temporary about us is this body will die. But we are eternal beings and we are going to live forever, each one of us. The question is, where? That's what we get to decide before we die is where are we going to live forever? Because we will live forever. What's really baffling is I listen to so many people carefully plan. Well, they call me even and they want to know if I've planned my financial future. They want to know how my investments are. They want to know how much um, how much I've um, put that into my 401k. They want to know what I've done with my retirement, my health, planning, all of these different things. And the same people, when I will ask them what their views are about God and eternity, will shut me down real fast. They have no plans to talk about that. And I find that really interesting because I think there is a really good chance that I may never need to know anything about my future. I mean, there's a good chance that I won't live to need my retirement. I mean, there's a lot of things that could happen. But there's also a really good chance that they're going to need to know what happens when they die. I mean, I would think that we stand an equal chance of needing to know what the other one has to talk about, but they have zero interest in hearing about mine. I once heard an analogy about eternity from someone that I found was very interesting. They said, if a little bird started out in California and dipped his beak in the ocean and flew all the way to New York and dumped his beak of water in the ocean in New York, flew all the way back to California and dipped his beak in the ocean and grabbed another beak of water, flew all the way back to New York and dumped his little beak of water in the ocean there, and then flew all the way back to California and got another beak of water and went all the way back to New York to dump that water in the ocean and just went back and forth and back and forth with his little beak of water by the time this little bird emptied the ocean on the California side into the ocean on the New York side, eternity would just be getting started. That's how much we need to be considering how serious eternity is. So I hear so many brilliant people, and we watch the news, we hear all of the medical terminology, and we hear so many people talking about great medical accomplishments with all the, certainly with the vaccines going on, but we don't hear anything about what happens post-death. We don't hear any talk about that, and the prospect of the fact that people could be living eternally, not dying, and it's done, that people actually are eternal and are living forever. We don't hear that talked about on the news. What if there was even a 5% chance that people realized that they live forever? What if that was the possibility? What if there was a possibility that there was a chance that all of your accumulated wealth and all of your accumulated knowledge was not following you into eternity. That eternal prospect that forever, everything you accumulated here knowledge-wise and intellectually was not following you. Nothing, nothing you did here was going into eternity. What if that was actually right? It would be worth knowing if there was even a 5% chance that that was right. What if there was this tiny chance that your children, if they weren't warned that they would go to hell for all of eternity if you didn't warn them, if they didn't have any idea how to avoid that, what if there was a chance that if they didn't know how to avoid that, if they were not made aware that if they didn't do these certain things or if they weren't aware of how to know God, the proper way, how to serve and honor God, 
and if they lived their life just void of him, that they would be without him for eternity, which means hell. How many parents are actually okay with that? That you not only do not teach your children the Bible, but you don't lead by example in your home. You just kind of hope that they catch it in church. You kind of lean on the church to be the example that 45 minutes a week that it falls on the youth pastor or you leave it to someone else. Most that I meet now that are really train wrecked in their life, they grew up in a home that identifies itself as Christian, yet they have no idea what born again really means when I ask them. They assume that they've always been a Christian because their home identifies as Christian. And this is the state of a local, our local charismatic churches. A lot of these young people or even some of them in their 20s and 30s, they grew up in Pentecostal charismatic churches. So it's not even the Lutheran or Baptist churches. These are charismatic churches. Only obedience to Jesus Christ will be rewarded in the afterlife. The road is narrow. Jesus is very clear about that. It is very much worth finding out the truth. He makes it something that we can access. There are Bibles everywhere. It is very clear in the Bible. The truth is, is very attainable. It's very easy to access. It is very worth finding out. You don't... Um, get to heaven by identifying as a Christian, by attending church. Jesus gave everything away. It was a total lifestyle. He even gave his life. He led by example, and he's very open about how to, how to be with him. Mark 8, 34 through 38 says, Then Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples, and he told them, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel will save it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This world and this experience in this life was not meant to be what most people think it is, to be enjoyed and to be this luxurious, self-indulgent um, experience. This, this life was meant to serve and to bear, bring honor and glory to the king. It was meant to be for him. It wasn't meant to be for us. And so when people think that they're being robbed of something to have to be told about God or to have to be um, reminded that they should be honoring God with their life. It was meant to be for him. He's the creator. We were, meant, we were made for him. It would be like your own children being offended when you ask them to respect you, that they would spit at you and get angry with you and and start cursing at you because you wanted them to just treat you with respect. God made us and we should honor him. That's the very least we should do. So when people think they're owed something on this earth, we're owed nothing. He's the creator, he's owed everything. That he even gave us life is far more than we deserve. I recently read something by Frank Powell entitled, Seven Ways Christians Waste Their Lives. Now this isn't seven ways people waste their lives. This is seven ways Christians waste their lives. And this is the exact message that is going to become a very heavy weight for some when they meet Jesus, because it's going to be the trade. It will be the trade-off. So rather than building the kingdom, taking people to heaven with them, the only thing that you can take with you, this was what mattered more to them. This is what they spent their 
time here with versus building the one thing that they were asked to build. You have time yet. If you're sitting here listening, you still are in time to be warned. So I'm giving you an early warning because one thing that is certain, you will stand before Jesus, whether it's to go to heaven or to be told you didn't make heaven, you will face Jesus. And, I, and you do have a chance yet to get this right. You are in time. I don't feel there's much time left, but you are in time. And here is the list that Mr. Powell wrote. Number one, distract yourself with good things. He said, here is what can be said about this promising generation. They never realized their potential because they busied themselves with many good things at the expense of their one thing. Their God-given purpose was their one thing. He says, your God-given purpose will scare you. It will stretch and push you far beyond your comfort zone. It will ask more from you than you have to give. And that's because your path is bigger than you. If you don't need God's help to make it happen, it's probably not your one thing. Only you know whether you're using good things to avoid engaging, engaging your one thing. Only you know. Number two, avoid what's right in front of you. So you're not sure about your one thing. Thankfully, God isn't sending you on a hopeless game of hide and seek. Your one thing is right in front of you, always. Make no mistake, you will waste your life if you avoid what's right in front of you. Maybe you're not where you're supposed to be. You're, you were created for more, but God has you where you are for a reason, and your obedience to the present moment determines the legacy that you leave. Number three, tell yourself that you don't have enough time. Do you know who doesn't have enough time? Everyone who says so. We're all on borrowed time. You're not the only one. Fair or not, he gives every human the same thing, 24 hours a day. You choose what to do with it. And don't forget, you serve a God who exists outside of time. He can take a few years and make them last a few centuries or more. You have just enough time to fulfill God's purpose for your life. Number four, talk about what you should do, but never actually do it. If you want a fast and quick way to waste your life, tell everyone what you're going to do. Talk about that mission trip you're going to take. Tell everyone about the coworker who doesn't know Jesus. Tell yourself you're going to do whatever it takes to beat that addiction. Tell everyone what's wrong with the world. Draw up a battle plan. Make it look good. Use some computer program to straighten up those lines and make your plans clear and coherent. Then do nothing. A meaningful life has a strong bias towards action. That is exactly why I chose Tatiana as my ministry partner. <laughs> I was working in this ministry where I met her for 20 years. She was actually a client when I met her, but I'm still trying to keep up with her vision three years later. Actually, yeah, three years. She is still running. I. I never met anyone there who I tried to keep up with. Actually, I was kind of running circles the whole time, always having ideas. She's kind of the one I'm trying to keep up with. So I'm always looking for visionaries. And I'm always, I love that about Shaylee also, is that she always has her eye on what is God going to do? She's always watching for what is he going to do. That's why I've always kind of kept my eye on her too. There's nothing, we're very messy in how we um, live life, but I love staying with people who keep the things of God on the front of their mind. I love, um, I love visionaries. Number five, watch a lot of TV. Watch a lot of social media. Spend a lot of time with just socially oriented relationships. The average person spends 9.1 years watching TV 
and another two years watching commercials. That's more than 11 years in front of the TV. And I want to say this directly, those who spend 11 years in front of the TV are wasting their lives. That doesn't include how much time that they're spending on social media. That also doesn't include how much time they probably spend in relationships that are just chit chatty, just socially going nowhere. Number six, believe certain false narratives about yourself. Your brain is a story forming machine. It takes your experiences, draws conclusions and judgments about them, and then pieces them together into nice, coherent narratives. Some of these stories are helpful, others not so much, and you have to be the final editor. Thoughts aren't necessarily facts, and you must decide which narratives frame your worldview. Behind almost every wasted life is a plethora of negative storylines. I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I will always be overweight, I will never overcome this, on and on and on. To make the most of your life, you must take control of the inner chatterbox and get it working for you and not against you. You must silence him. Well, you, it says you can't silence him, nor should you, but you must have a serious conversation with him if you haven't already. You don't need to say much, just get your inner voice, not calling the shots, Tell him he's free to share his thoughts, but that you are the boss. You will sort out which thoughts are lies and which are the truth. Then direct him to the back seat and tell him to fasten his seatbelt. Number seven, wait for permission. If you sit around waiting for a permission slip or board to validate your purpose, you will waste your life. God signed off on your permission slip the moment he placed you on this earth. All you need is faith in yourself, yes, and more importantly, in your creator who is working through you. Your voice matters. You have something to give this world, something no one else can give. We need your contribution. Step out in faith and give it. God placed you here for a reason. As long as you have breath in your lungs, you can make a difference in this world. Part of what I am, I think, designed for and what I love to do is kind of being a cheerleader for people. I love to motivate and I love to, um, I love when people kind of come to me with their scrambled dreams and their um, just kind of um, even a very vague idea of what they want to do or what they love to do. And what I have watched happen in the last, at least the last two years is over the last more than that, there's a number of us that have worked together over probably 15 years that have watched a large group of people, of very gifted people, rise and fall, rise and fall, that needed a team to come around them and really guide them and, and really launch them out into their destinies. And I'm watching that team come together. I'm really watching a wheel build. And it's been pretty amazing to watch that, the networking that's gone on in that. It's, it's nothing short of a miracle. I've, it's been very amazing to watch that come together. And, and to see the people that for years, a lot of us have thought, wow, that person is so amazing. I wish that outside of treatment, there was someone who could help them get up because they would be a world changer. Now that can actually happen. And so for those of you who are in that group, who have always wished that there were people who could help you, um, there's a lot more pieces in place now. I would encourage you to reach out because there are a large, a much larger group of us now that are on the outside of probably organized programming that are really working hard to bring order and structure to um, opportunities for you. We really want you to be able to thrive in your giftings and callings and Mine specifically is to help you find the right people that will help you make it and help you put some order and structure to what it is that you're designed for, what you're gifted at, um, to help, um, to just really help you see what you're for, to help you, um, to help you see what you would be good at and what you would thrive in. So I always welcome you to call me. 
um, I would love to meet with you and I would love to help you to find next steps and I would help you link to next people. I am very much an encourager and I, I really look forward to what's coming, especially in this area for people who have not really had the chance to make it in the past. So I know God is really doing a great thing around here and, and I'm really excited for what he's building. I, um, I want to give you um, a lot of hope and I know that God has never given up on many of you in case you felt that way. I really urgently ask you to try again. Please try again. Now I want to give you a picture of what, a vague picture of what the final judgment looks like because I think people are so short-sighted on this earth that they don't think about the fact that when you die, you face judgment. Christian or not Christian, you face judgment when you die. It's not done. You will live forever. You will face God. Christian or not Christian, whether you believe in him or not, you will face God when you die. I regret how many who never gave him a thought here in this life are going to have a shocking reality when they die. That's going to be a terrible first encounter. Death is not the end, as I said. You will live forever somewhere. This judgment will show where you will live forever. Your decisions today will determine where that will be. That's why I want you to be warned that if you're listening, you have a chance to change the where. The fact that there's going to be a final judgment for all men, both believers and unbelievers, men and women, is clearly confirmed in multiple parts of the Bible. Every person will one day stand before Jesus Christ and be judged for their deeds done here on earth. The great white throne judgment is described in Revelation 20, 11 through 15 and is the final judgment prior to the lost being cast into the lake of fire. We know from Revelation 27 through 15 that this judgment will take place after the thousand year reign and after Satan is thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are in Revelation 19, 19 through 20, 20, 7 through 10. And the books that are opened according to Revelation 20, 12 contain the records of everyone's deeds, everyone, whether they are good or evil, because God knows everything, everything that has ever been said, everything that has ever been done, and everything that has ever been thought. All of these things have been recorded in books. Everything that's been said by each person, everything that's been done, and everything that's been thought. It's all been recorded. And he will reward or punish each person accordingly. And there are multiple references in Psalms, Romans, and Revelation to verify this. The Bible says that God has set a day in which he proposes to judge the earth according to Acts 17.31. And this day of judgment, also known as the final judgment, is when Jesus, the Son of God, will judge the living and the dead before destroying the old heaven and earth, which are corrupted with sin, which is what we are presently living in. And because Jesus is both God and man, he is the perfect judge of men, his judgment will be fair perfect, just, and not subject to appeal. He's not like sinful human rulers who judge unfairly and seek to accomplish their own purposes when they judge. Instead, Jesus states, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 5.30 we can be assured that Jesus is a fair judge and he will enact judgment according to his wisdom and righteousness. The Son of God will transform a world full of injustice into a place of peace and safety. No more will the guilty go free. No more will the innocent suffer. 
He will make the righteous reward shine like the dawn and your vindication like the noonday sun, Psalm 37, 6. This is where all scores will be settled. All those who victimize children, women, animals, men, others, workers, it's all going to show up there. What is done in secret will be shouted from the rooftops, the Bible says. That is why it is wisdom to face God before judgment day. His wrath will be unrelenting at that point. And for those who wonder why some get away with such terrible things, they won't. It's all recorded and it's all going to be shown. Sin can be defined as anything that opposes God's law and God's will. And to engage in sin is to disobey or abuse his laws. And because the urge to sin resides in human nature, man is corrupt and driven by the immoral inclination that lives in all people. This is the consequence of the fall in the Garden of Eden. And before creating his new heaven and earth, God is going to do away with anything that can produce sin in his new creation. And Jesus will act as the judge of the last judgment, as the Bible says. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgments to the Son. John 5, 22. All those who didn't believe will be judged by Jesus Christ at the great white throne, and they will face punishment in accordance with the acts that they have done. The Bible is very definite that unbelievers are scoring up vengeance against themselves and that God will give to each person according to what he has done. Romans 2, 5 through 6. At the final judgment, the destiny of the wicked and non-believers will be in the control of the Almighty God who will assess everyone according to the state of their soul. 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says, Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, all, that each one will, may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Matthew 12.36-37 says, But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. 2 Timothy 4.1 says, I solemnly charge you before God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his manifestation and his kingdom. Revelation 20.10-15 says, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Another book is open called the book of life. It is this book that determines whether a person will inherit eternal life with God or receive everlasting punishment in the lake of fire as it refers to. Although Christians are held accountable for their actions, they are forgiven in Christ and their names are written in the book of life from the creation of the world in Revelation 17.8. We also know from the Bible that it is at this judgment when the dead will be judged according to what they have done, Revelation 20.12, and that anyone's name that is not found written in the book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire. At the judgment seat of Christ, believers are rewarded based on how faithfully they served Christ. There is a judgment and a reward system. So it isn't just everyone goes to heaven and it's an equal playing field when you get there. It is not like that. There is a reward system for believers on how they lived here. 
some of the things that we will be judged on are how well we obeyed the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18 to 20 says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always and to the very end of the age. Also, how victorious we were over sin, Romans 6, 1 through 4. How shall we say then, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And how well we controlled our tongues, James 3, 1 through 9. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Verse 3, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Verse 4, or take ships as an example, although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Verse 7, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. The Bible speaks of believers receiving crowns for different things based on how faithfully they serve Christ in 1 Corinthians 9, 4 through 27 and 2 Timothy 2, 5. The various crowns are described in 2 Timothy, James, Peter, Revelations. Um, they give a good summary of how we should think about the judgment seat of Christ. It says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive a crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. The Bible mentions rewards in heaven several times. It mentions rewards that await the believer who serves the Lord faithfully in this, faithfully in this world. Matthew 10, 41, a great reward is promised to those who are persecuted for Jesus' sake. Various crowns are mentioned in 2 Timothy 4, 8. Jesus says that he will bring rewards with him when he returns in Revelation 22:12. We are to treasure the Lord Jesus most of all. When Jesus is our treasure, we will commit our resources, our money, our time, our talents to his work in this world. Our motivation for what we do is important, according to 1 Corinthians 10:31. Paul encourages servants that God has an eternal reward for those who are motivated to serve Christ. Colossians 3, 23 to 24 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Jesus Christ you are serving. When we live sacrificially for Jesus' sake or serve him by serving the body of Christ, we store up treasure in heaven. Even seemingly small acts of service do not go unnoticed by God. In Matthew 10, 42, he says, If anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person certainly will not lose their reward. So he speaks often of those who stay focused on serving with the kingdom to come in mind, they're definitely going to receive rewards for that in the kingdom to come. Those who pay no mind to the kingdom to come are definitely going to have a different level of, there's going to be a loss for them. 
some of the more visible gifts, such as teaching, singing, playing music, they might be tempted to use that gift. So there's people who are very gifted in certain areas. I know many of them. I am not one of them. There are some who are tempted to use those talents um, in ways where they will receive great praise from man, this side of heaven, rather than seeking God's glory. And God is very clear that if they seek praise from man instead of his glory and use those gifts for his glory, that they will receive their payment in full and here. They won't receive it there. The applause of man is the extent of it. The, there will be no reward for it in heaven. So that's a very short-sighted, you get this amazing gift from God, and then you get this really short window of reward that lasts minutes versus for eternity. You just shorted yourself forever. That's something to think about. If you've got one of the incredible gifts of especially music or um, the, especially the musical gifts, consider, consider using that for the God and not for your own glory. The Lord will be faithful to award us for the service we give him, according to Hebrews 6.10. Although our ministries may differ, the Lord that we serve is the same. The man who plants, the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor, 1 Corinthians 3.8. I love the quote that says, It's amazing how much work men can do when no one cares who gets the credit. And one thing I have learned, I've been out in ministry a long time, and I have watched ministries attack each other attack each other compete attack compete attack tear down compete attack i have learned so much out here that i am i'm surrounding myself now with people who are of the opposite mindset they they will absolutely lay down everything for each other like they're just giving 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 to build up each other i'm watching ministries seek to build each other all for a common good because we all love the same people and we're out here for the same purpose we want these people in heaven and we want them building with us we want to see an army raised for jesus christ and we know how we, we just, we love the same people. We think so highly of each other. We don't have the desire to make big names for ourselves. We just don't care about that. We want to see the name of Jesus Christ exalted. I'm, I'm, a, I'm just um, honored at the character of I just even in the last few years, just watching how how this, you know, just seven bells, there's been so many people and how it just shook out to just the few, you know, God just allowed it to, I, I just, the whole process of just watching him shake and, and then bringing us to, um, um, partner with others who are of, of the same mission. We all have these different parts and I really finally feel like I'm watching kingdom building like I've never seen it before and it's such an honor to see and work with people the way that we are now. It's, it's amazing. I love watching and experiencing this. It was exhausting before. It was exhausting before watching ministries. Um, the competition was exhausting. I just knew, 
I just, it was exhausting. It was very disillusioning and very exhausting. The rich young ruler loved his money more than he loved God. And when a ministry loves money more than God, it's exhausting. And it feels so draining. Jesus pointed this out very clearly to him in Matthew 19, 16 through 30. He pointed it out to this young man. The issue wasn't that the young man was rich. Jesus never condemns someone for being rich. What he condemns is that their riches matter more to them than he does. And when the gospel takes second place to money, that's when Jesus steps out and that's when things start to feel bad and that's what happened here Jesus let the young man know your riches mean more to you than I do and that's when the young man dropped his head and walked away because he knew that this was true and he couldn't see himself parting with his money so when you see that somebody's choices are for the money and not for Jesus, I say to walk away because it's not worth losing Jesus over. When you lose Jesus, you lose everything. It's not worth losing your salvation. It's not worth losing heaven. And it's not worth losing all these precious people to hell. It is not worth it. It is not worth it. There is never, ever a time when you should align with greed because the price you will pay in the end will not be worth it. You will regret every single day that you chose to align with greed over the gospel. Always stand with the gospel. We are warned not to lose our reward by following after any false alignment, false teacher. That's why it's important to be in the word so that you can recognize these alignments, always stand firm in the truth. It's more important now than ever because you come under fire now when you preach the truth because people are so lukewarm that when you preach the truth now, you get chastised because people are so, the lukewarm gospel now seems like the truth to people. The This grace message is, People swear it's in the Bible. They'll tell you you're the one that's the heretic because so many pastors are telling them that's the truth and that you're the one that's preaching heresy when you tell them what the Bible really says. I, was, I recently lost a long relationship over a ministry, over an endless rebuke. It got offended. The exact offense came over the Great Commission, I addressed the Great Commission as being everyone's responsibility, that we were all responsible for the Great Commission. And pastor was clear, you're an evangelist, Wendy. The Great Commission is your responsibility, not everyone's. You can't push that on everyone else. Your, your passion for the Great Commission is your passion for the Great Commission, not everyone's passion. You can't force that on other people. And I understood the Great Commission is all Christians, all believers are responsible for the gospel. And the offense over this divided us because we continue to see this differently. The treasures that await the child of God will far outweigh any trouble, any inconvenience, any persecution that we face, I promise you. The pleasure, the joy of the Lord, the peace of God that passes all understanding. Um, we have had so many personal words from God. We have had such an intimate um, relationship with God that there's just nothing like this experience that I would not trade it for anything. I I have never had a life close to what we've had in the last few years. I would not trade it for anything. I can't even 
put in words what this experience has been like. It has been the worst of times, but it's been the most amazing of times also. Um, I would say serve the Lord wholeheartedly, knowing that God is the one keeping the score and his reward will be abundantly gracious. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It is worth it. It is worth it. It is worth it. It is worth it. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. God will give great rewards in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ based on your faithfulness and service to him. The rewards will show the reality of our sonship and the justice of God. God will give rewards in heaven in order to fulfill the law of sowing and reaping and make good on his promise that our labor in the Lord was not in vain. In this way, rewards in heaven glorify God and provide us with joy and peace and wonder as we consider God's work in us and through us. And the closer we were to God during this life, the more centered on him, dependent on him, desperate for his mercy and more, though just the more earnest we were in seeking what is his will, which is what we do constantly is, where are you taking us, God? What do you want us to do? We're always trying to figure out where, is, where are we supposed to go with this? The more there is to celebrate. And when the end comes and the desire is fulfilled, the more glorious will be the end of our story. The story would not be satisfying if it weren't such a crazy adventure. This is such a crazy adventure. It's the kind that when I was little and read reading books, this is the kind of story we're having. It's just been a crazy adventure. Rewards in heaven are the completion of our earthly story, and those rewards are going to be eternally satisfying. And I am, I have not one regret. I don't think we have any regrets. None. We have none. We have, we have been perplexed. We have been pressed and perplexed many times. We have been just pressed and pressed and pressed. We have been shocked and dismayed and and certainly shocked at things, but we are so, oh, we're so in awe of God. I would say to all, please, 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 do not forever miss, forever is a long time because it's forever. So forever you will have in heaven a reward that you could trade right now for TV, a relationship that probably isn't even that great, fear of man, um, um, greed, um, your salary. I like my salary too much to, to give it up, to go launch out into the deep with some of the crazy people out there with that she's talking about. I don't want to get radical like those people. So I just, I'm going to stay where it's safe here. I would say, why? Would you miss it? Why would you miss it? I would not hold back. I have done that. I did that. And I now haven't done that. And I am, I am elated that I made the jump into this. Pray for us that we continue to pursue God with abandon and that we stay bold in the face of changing times and that we just continue to um, stay radical for Jesus because he stays radical for us and that we um, that he just keeps giving us more and more favor um, just pray for us and then I just encourage you that if you if you want to be born again or if you want to um, be encouraged on how to on how to leap into um, more please reach out to us precious Lord you are the most amazing one
far more than anyone has ever written in a book that I've ever read, and I've read many things, but you are far more amazing than words can ever express, and I've lived a crazy, crazy life of sin, and I've lived a crazy life with you, and I just, I find you unspeakable. I find you unspeakable, and I just find it, I find it, I am in awe that you picked me and I find it I am I'm just overwhelmed and blessed that you have given me a position at the table where I get to partake in in just kingdom business I pray for everyone that is involved in everything that I get to do and I pray that you help us all out here that you let us do even bigger things for you and with you and that there would be revival in our midst that it would break out like crazy around here and I pray that you would add many many more to our midst and I ask that you would, for anyone listening, that you would just blow Holy Spirit fire through everyone that's hearing and give them an excitement for what would it be like to be partnering with the King? What would happen if I said yes to, what would happen if I just said yes, okay yes God I'll go what would happen just say yes he will say what happens just say yes I'll go just go Jesus help us to be faithful as you were faithful to go to the cross for us help us to be faithful We love you, Jesus. I ask this all in your precious name. Amen.